Good morning. I hope you're ready for a fight. I came ready for a fight today. Almost need a trainer here to get my gloves on. Did you get ready for a fight? I hope you came for a fight. I like fighters. I like fighters. You know? I'm still quick. Might be old, but I'm still quick. We need some fight. We're going to fight the good fight of faith. First Timothy, the series John started that will continue through the next number of weeks, is about the fight of faith. And I'm going to talk about Paul's fight of faith. You can learn a lot from Paul's fight of faith. And from Paul's fight of faith, I hope you learned how to fight, your, to fight the faith. You need to learn to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, right? <laughs> and the good news is, the enemy that you're fighting is already a defeated foe. He's already been knocked out. He just doesn't know that you're going to keep knocking him out, right? So we're going to talk about how we fight the good fight of faith. And there's three little pictures in here. There's three, I believe, knockout punches for you to use against the enemy in your daily lives. Some people say this passage, this part is a digression. I was kind of hoping John would give me verse 18, which is, you know, to war a good warfare to the prophecy, but he took the good part. But I got a good part too, because they're all good parts. And these are real practical things. I found that we need to get back to practical Christian living. Practical Christian living. And I believe there's three knockout punches in these number of verses I'm going to read. And I want to remind you as we look, and you can turn with me to 1 Timothy, remind you that later on in 2 Timothy, Paul's going to say that I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. And I don't know about you, but I believe that we're here to help people finish the race that God set before them. And I've got good news. You're going to be running a race that's already been won. You're going to be drafting behind Jesus as you run the race by his grace and by his power. All of us have had moments in our life where we've tried to live the Christian life in our own strength and it doesn't work. It's very important that we learn the fight of faith. Now it's important to realize that Paul, in verse 12, that John so in a great message last Sunday, that John preached, he could chew on that all week long and he talked in the last verse of verse 12 about the glorious gospel of blessed God which was committed to my trust. We need, I think, to remind the church in the hour that we live that we've been committed to trust the gospel of the kingdom. And the only thing that's going to change this world is not us being on this side and have people on the other side yelling and screaming back and forth ideologies and all the things that the news wants to do and all the things the world wants to do and all the things the devil wants to do. We need to get back to being committed to bring the gospel of the Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. That's what changes individuals. That's what changes cities. That's why... You know, whereas uh, as, a big, as big as a soul, it's, uh, let me get this right. As small as, city. as small as a city and as big as a soul, right? Because it's souls, it's people getting touched by the gospel that changes cities. And I think one of the enemy's distractions is to get us away from the simple love and devotion that's in Jesus and the supernatural power in the gospel of the kingdom. It's be, we're all here because we heard the good news or you're here to hear the good news. If you don't know Jesus, my prayer is this morning that you'll totally commit your life to Jesus. If you're watching by Facebook Live or wherever you are, that you'll hear the good news today. In Acts 26, there's three times that Paul speaks of his personal testimony. And in the third time in Acts 26, verse 16, he says, But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. So you were born again, if you're a Christian, by the Holy Spirit, and you received Christ, and you had an encounter with God like Paul did in some way. And what happened was, is you were called to be a minister and a witness. That's what we were called to do. And I want to ask you, how are you serving and how are you witnessing unto Jesus? Really important. He said, I not only appeared to you at that moment, but I will appear unto you and reveal things and show you. As you run the race that you have, God will reveal things. My prayer is God will reveal something to you today. And we have all been called to be ministers and servants. We've all been given a great task to accomplish individually and corporately. And we all put our visions together as a church family. It's amazing how we help each other and how we've been providentially placed here by God. It wasn't an accident that you were here. It wasn't an accident that God placed us in Everett. It wasn't an accident that God placed us in this county. And in Revelation 19.10, 
John the Revelator speaks and said, I fell at his feet to worship him, speaking of an angel. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we're going to learn one of the, one of the knockout punches is, was Paul's testimony. When was the last time you shared your testimony with someone? The Gospels are just testimonies of how people had encounters with God. The book of Acts is just full of testimonies of witnesses and ministers sharing their testimony that caused other people to realize that they could have a testimony. Very, very important. So when the word testimony is used in the New Testament, inherent in that that original Greek word is that's actually saying when you hear how God did this for someone, he can do the same thing for you. He's no respecter of persons. The same grace that was released to a drug addict, if you're a drug addict, can be released to you. The same thing that was um, released to someone who was anxiety that got delivered from fear, that same testimony has power to cause you to be delivered from fear. That same testimony that speaks of healing. I remember when we spoke of uh, a healing that took place in someone's knee. I remember, is Stephanie? I thought I saw Stephanie. Remember when your knee got healed up here? I thought I was in a Benny Hinn meeting. I saw this knee brace come flying at me. I almost had to duck. Her knee brace came flying off. She ran up here like an NFL, uh, she's in the NFL combine, and she was jumping up and down on the platform high off the ground, and I was just standing there going. She said, my knee just got healed, and she gave a testimony, and that week in the three, two or three services, I think it was two, 70 people's knees got healed because of one testimony. See, the the devil wants you to be more concerned about Fox News, CNN, what this said and what that person said than telling the good news of the testimony of Jesus in your life. That's what's going to change the world. That's what happened in the Bible. We need to get back to sharing our testimony and the power that's inherent when you share testimonies. I'm going to share a testimony later in the message. So, Father, I pray that you would powerfully show us in this passage that Paul's pattern example was not only just his pattern example, but we have a pattern and we have an example that we can share with others that will change their lives, not only in this world, but the one to come. So, Father, we pray through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit that you'd speak to every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So when you look at the first punch, a good boxer knows a good jab is the first punch you throw. You begin to jab the enemy and, and just, you know, you begin to jab him. First of all, you'll see the first punch on the screen. Your first punch is Paul gave himself to thanksgiving. Yep. We live in a world and we live in a circumstances that people are under a lot of pressure and it's easy to become a grumbler. It's easy to become a complainer. It's easy to find all the things that are wrong with something. But one of the keys to fighting the good fight of faith is to have an attitude of gratitude. To begin to thank God. And I want to encourage you. I felt like some of you are in really hard situations. You know the way out of your situation is to begin to thank God that he's going to move in the midst of your difficult situation. That God specializes in possible situations. It's so much fun to me at times to just have a gift of faith rise up and tell somebody that's just told me it's impossible that you watch. God's going to show up this week and do something. And then they come, they, they go, you're not going to believe this. And I go, yes, I am. I'm a believer. I actually believe God's going to do what he promised. So I just want to encourage you today that God wants to use thanksgiving. And it means to have a constant gratitude in the original language. You be constantly thanking God. You know, when you see news that's terrible, just say, God, I thank you that in the midst of these terrible news and circumstances, you've got a greater news. You've got greater love. You've got greater grace. You've got greater power than these things that are trying to destroy people's lives and nations' lives. And we're going to see your kingdom come, and I thank you for what you're going to do. 
1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So if you quit complaining and begin to thank God that in the midst of everything, he's going to show up and do something that only he can do, that only he can get the glory and the honor for. And then Paul goes on to give thanks to Christ for enabling him, empowering him. It literally means in duos, the word to clothe with to furnish with anything and everything you have need of. He thanked God that in the midst of me being a persecutor and a blasphemer and an insolent man, that you gave me everything that I had need of. You know what? It says grace for grace. You know what that means? That whatever grace you need, that grace is available in Jesus. And sometimes people go, oh, you don't understand how hard it is. I said, no, the problem is you don't understand how much grace is in Jesus to be released into that hard place in your life. It's grace for whatever grace. And you can come boldly to the throne of grace in your time of need to find mercy and help in your time of need. Not when you have it all together, not when everything is going wonderful. You can come boldly to the throne of grace and begin to thank him for what he's going to do. And he'll do incredible things. He'll do awesome things. He'll do unusual things. And he says... That he empowered me. Do you know that God's empowered you? God's empowered you. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can. I know some of you think really big, but God thinks way bigger. I know some of you got big dreams, but God's got way bigger dreams for your life than you do. You know, I had to worship God this week. I got the schedule for the Cook Highlands where we're going in May. And I'm looking at the list of the first night. His Excellency is speaking first, His Excellency over the islands. The second speaker is the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. And the last person is my name, the fifth speaker. I'm the convener and the visionary of the conference that I didn't know I convened or that I had a vision for. (laughs) He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can even ask or think according to the power of His grace working in you. We need to get over ourselves and let the king of glory shine through and let him do things that only he can do. Yeah. And I'd be a fool to take any credit for that. And I've already been a fool long enough in my life. I'm only a fool for Jesus now. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Not the mysteries of the world, not the mysteries of what people think necessarily, but the mysteries of God, of the good news of Jesus Christ and what he can do in people's lives. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And so Paul goes on to say that he's not only thankful for enabling, but he's also thankful that he's counted him faithful. It's, we all know God's faithful, but it's amazing when God can say, I count you faithful. I love Luke 16, verse 10. It gives you the three tests of increase and in, in, enlarging your sphere of influence. First of all, if you're faithful in the little things, it will open a door for you to be faithful in the big things. It also says if you're faithful with unrighteous mammon with money, then God will give you true riches. If you're not faithful with your money, why would God give us true spiritual riches to deal in? It also says if you're not faithful with another man's goods, why would God give you your own? How you... Serve your boss, how you serve your company, how you serve those around you actually opens doors for you in the future. And I know so many people that grumble, well, you know, you don't know where I work out. And I said, you know what, well, did did God put you there? Well, yeah, but you know it's really bad. (laughs) Well, then why did God put you there? To make a difference. I walked in churches and people say, nobody's friendly around here. Look at them all. I said, well, then make yourself a committee of one to the glory of God. And be so happy that people will have to smile when they see you. You'll force them to smile. I do that with one of my grandchildren. I know when they get a little bit grumpy some days, I say, I know there's a smile way deep down in that stomach. I can see it. I don't care how grumpy she is. She's got a big smile on her face by the time I'm done with her. And if you're in a place where it's grumpy and there's a bad attitude, be a good attitude. Be a model. Be a pattern of what a Christian really is like. We're not just against a bunch of stuff. We're for Jesus. We're for love. We're for grace. We're for truth. We're for righteousness. We're for helping people and healing people. They know what we're against. Let's show them what we're for. Paul then gave thanks to Christ for putting him into the ministry. He appointed him. He anointed him. He placed him. He chose him for his ministry, his diakonika, his service, like the deacons are there to serve. They're to be a model of service. 
You know what, what, what how are we serving our community? How are we serving? I love that, that we've gone into a local school and we've been invited through Andre's relationship into, to mentor students. I'd like to see 50 or 100 people from this church at the local high school mentoring students because it'll make a difference. You know, they say this can't be done. Pastor Kevin started something in Lake Stevens. It's public now, so we don't have to worry about it. Middle schoolers, close to a couple hundred kids every week coming to the Jesus Bible Club. Hello? And when the former teacher that was the music teacher that sponsored the club, you can find one teacher to sponsor a club, you can have a club. It's God's way into the school. Had some um, problems with Alzheimer's and things, was a Christian. And so they said the next person that was going to be the music teacher, they made it a prerequisite that they would sponsor the Bible club. <laughs> now, God will work when you don't even know he's working. That's the fun of it. He's Jehovah's sneaky. He sneaks up on you. <laughs> so I'm preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and guess who showed up that Sunday? The new teacher, yeah, the Holy Spirit showed up, but the new teacher showed up. And he said, well, I better find out what this church is. He's not filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm speaking on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's standing over, he raises up his hand, and I look at him. I don't know who he is. I don't know he's the, I say, you need to go ahead and pray with Herb and Bethany. They're standing right there. I didn't know that Herb had talked to him on the phone during that week. And guess what happened? He got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they needed someone to teach drums in the school. And guess who lives up by their school and teaches drums? Scott Smith. So guess what Scott Smith's doing? He's teaching drums in the public school to the drummers. Hello? You have a ministry. Who are you serving? Instead of railing against, you know, instead of railing against just a, and, I, and I'm, you'll hear by the end of the day, you know what, I, I'm, we're pro-life here. Abortion is wrong. We love people that have been through the horror of abortion, and many of them, you know what? They're ignorant and they're in unbelief, just like you and I were. So let's not act so proud or smug or that we're better than other people because without the grace of God, we all would have been there. Right? But what if we start to serve mothers? What if we start to serve people? What if we, and we've been serving the crisis pregnancy clinic, we've been, we've been giving to them for years and years. And what if we started to serve the gospel? What if we started to serve the schools and just showed up and said, what could I do to serve? They might say, we need someone to help with lunch or we might need someone to empty the garbage and just start emptying the garbage just to the glory of God. Start praying. You know, they just had a big thing with Lou Engel this week on this generation. I remember when Cheon met him and said, what do you do? And he said, I mow lawns 40 hours a week. He goes, that must be the most boring job in the world. And he goes, no, I get to pray in the spirit for 40 hours on a lawnmower and I get paid for 40 hours of intercession. See, we need, we need to look at where God's place is. Why did he place us here? So we could have a warm building to come to and talk about God and worship him. Know that we could affect, yes, that too, but also to affect the community. Also to affect the world that we live in. And he was thankful. He was chosen. You're all chosen. You're all important. And begin to thank God for where he's placed you. Begin to thank God for your neighborhood. Start to do walks through your neighborhood. I've been, we've been walking through our neighborhood four times a week, and I pray, and I say, God, have the Holy Spirit fall in this neighborhood. We've already talked about it. You know, we, year by year, as we were the senior pastors, we'd have workers over, and you know, we said, you know, you know what we should do this year? We should, we should have a community. We should have a community Christmas party. Invite all our neighbors to our house. Woo! Invite them all over for Christmas and just have cookies. And we're not going to bushwhack them with the gospel. We're not going to pull them and say, well, the real reason we got you here was to... Uh... <laughs> we're just going to love on them and build relationships. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Start investing in your neighborhood. Start being faithful with the little things with your neighbor, with your people at work, and do something kind for them. That's the first punch. So you're going to do what this week? Fight with what? What's the first punch to start jabbing the devil with? Start jabbing him with thanksgiving everywhere you go. And the harder it gets, thank him more. And it'll drive the devil nuts. He's already nuts anyway. Secondly, Paul gave himself to testify. The second punch, your testimony. When was the last time you shared your testimony with anyone? I thought it might get quiet. <laughs> We're really good at sharing in church. Oh, yeah, I was saved 43 years. Have you told anybody outside the church? Yeah. Let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit out of the bag. The Holy Spirit gets Holy Spirit cabin fever. He's in you to get out of you. 
He feels like snow days sometimes after two weeks. I mean, when, when your kids get tired of snow, you know it's time for the snow to go away. They've been praying for it. Now they're going, I, I didn't want to come this much. I want, I want to go to school. I want to go do something. Hello? Let him get out of you. Just start taking those little steps and pray for someone or talk to someone or share with someone. And Paul gave himself to testify of his past. The good news is because shame has been broken and guilt's been broken in our life, we can share all the bad stuff if it's appropriate. We don't want to glorify our sin, but we want to glorify the God who delivered us from our sin. You don't have to shoot 14 people and be a part of the mafia to have a testimony. Thank God for the people that did that stuff. They got saved. I'll never forget the Sunday I was praying and I walked up this Italian looking guy looked like he could have been in one of those you know, Italian movies with the mafia. He was a short guy and had the, you know, the mustache, the typical that Italian look. And, and I was just goofing around. You gotta be careful when you're prophetic. And I, I grabbed his arms and he, I mean, he was just like about this tall, but his arms were just felt like, you know, like those poles with ripples in them. And I was like, and I said, uh, I said, I know you're Italian, you know, and you used to live in Jersey and you used to whack people for a living, right? And he goes, he goes yeah, how'd you know? He goes, I don't whack people anymore. I whack the devil for Jesus now. He and his wife started coming. It was a true story. He was, he was a hitman for the mafia. You got to be careful when you come to the altar with prophetic people. They start goofing around. They get in trouble. I, I really respected him after that. He goes, yeah, we used to put him in cement, and they went swimming in the East River. But Jesus forgave me for all that stuff. Paul said, I was a blasphemer. I was a blasphemer. I reviled God. I used God's name in vain. He said, I wasn't only a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was persecuting the church. There's persecutors out there that are going to become preachers and teachers and apostles that if we'll engage them with the love of Christ like Stephen the martyr did and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that was the the go that was used by God, I believe, on Paul's heart because he was a member, I believe, of the Sanhedrin because he said, I counted or I voted, which only the Sanhedrin had a vote. And he was out pulling people out of their homes, having them killed. I love what it says. If you don't think it was that serious, this is Paul's own words in Galatians 1.13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Paul the apostle was once Paul the persecutor who sought to destroy the church. He thought he was doing God a service and doing it. And then he said he was an insolent man. How many know what the word insolent means? I'm glad you do because I had to look it up. There's like nine in the first service. I don't know if there's about three of us in the second service. It's from a Hebrew word that means it had a joy in afflicting and bringing shame. They not only persecuted, but they had a joy, a sadistic joy in doing it. Paul was saying, I enjoyed. I enjoyed not only persecuting, but I I enjoyed the shame and the stuff. I mean, you've seen some of the things of martyrdom. I don't know, it got a little closer to home when Dr. Thomas told me that some of the students I'd had in class and been able to pour my life in as much as I could to them young men in India had been martyred for their faith. And they'd gone to their hometown to share the love of Christ and they had their heads chopped off and were, were, were thrown into a well. I remember the time that I went to go with Dr. Thomas to India. He was going to take me to Bihar where a lot, of the, a lot of the spiritual warfare goes on and a lot of the real needs for deliverance, some real dark area of, of India. And I was supposed to go with him. I was looking forward to it. And I got there and I said, where's Dr. Thomas? And they said, he left already. And I said, I was supposed to go with him. He said, he told you to tell you it was too dangerous to take you. It was right at that time when an Australian missionary who served lepers for 22 years who served the lepers of India for 22 years, he and his child, were, their car, gasoline was poured over it, gasoline was poured, they lit them on fire and burned them to death. The head of India got on national television and said, we have been shamed by the Christians. We need to realize just someone arguing with us and saying a few bad things is nothing compared to the martyrdom that many people are facing today because they love Jesus and because they've gone to honor God. 
There's been more martyrs, and we need to realize that some of them, their blood crying out to the get ground, out of the ground is going to cause, I believe, areas and regions to be saved yeah. because of the sacrifices they have made. He was an insolent man. He enjoyed the persecuting. So Paul gave himself to testify of his past because you know what? He knew that people that would hear him could relate to him. He also remembered where he'd come from in his testimony. Remembering where we come from helps to keep us from pride. As God blesses you and uses you, it's very easy to think that you and I are really something. It's very easy to believe our own press. But when you remember your past and what you were without Jesus, it always keeps you in a place of humility. That without the grace of God on our life, all of us could be any of the things that we're seeing that are bad in the world or in our lives. And the people's problems that he was talking about, here he said he obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He wasn't stupid, he was ignorant. See, people don't know what they're doing. We, we need to realize that. Yes. The enemy wants us to fight people. People are not our, but we're to love people. Yes. We're to bless people. Yes. Muslims are not a problem, they're a promise. Yeah. Hello? The people on CNN are not a problem, they're a promise. The people on CNBC or CNBC, you know what? They're not a problem, they're a promise. And when we start to see them the way that God sees them, and we start to have the attitude that Paul had, our lives are changed. And like Paul, our testimony can make a difference. And then Paul not only remembered where he'd come from, and he not only remembered... Uh, his, his past, but he testified of what Jesus had done for him. It's really important we tell what Jesus has done for us. He said the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant. Exceedingly abundant, superabounded. Romans 5.20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. God's grace superabounds. You have received the grace of God so you can give away the grace of God. Why do we expect people who are not Christians to show Christian attitudes and Christian graces? It's impossible for them. I don't care how good a people they are, they can't show forth the grace and love of God. You can only give away what you've received. And we've received so much. I love 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. We'll get there. It says that the grace of God... The grace of God was so poured in to Paul. And Paul said it was poured into him. And you know what? He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, my son. Therefore, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And commit to faithful men and faithful women those things that you heard from me. That they might teach others who will teach others. So in the first service, my granddaughter Haley got baptized. It was awesome. She's 13 and went through the waters of baptism you have to align all the planets to bring all our families together so they could all be here. <laughs> They're all there in the back this morning. And I realized that I got saved, my wife got saved. And then watched poured into John. Now watch Haley and Haley. You know what? It goes on to four generations. Yes. You're going to teach those who teach those who teach those. You're going to have a four generation. I was reading this morning in my devotions how one of the kings, God kept his promise for four generations of what would happen. You affect generations when you obey God. And that grace that was poured into you, as you receive that grace, as you pour that grace into other people, they're going to pour that grace into other people. It's like, you know, a big pitcher. You start pouring grace into the next pitcher, and they become a pitcher that pours grace into the, And guess what? The more you pour in, the more God pours out. And you're pouring out grace on. People don't need law. People don't need someone sticking their finger in their face. People in the world need grace, just like you and I needed grace. And Paul said, guess what? He said, that grace will super. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can even ask or think according to the power that is working through us. So the second punch is your testimony. And Paul said, you know what? He's a pattern. That word is a word that means model or a template. It means a sketch. He said, I'm going to sketch out to you my testimony. And somewhere in my sketch and somewhere in my model, God's going to fill in the blanks with you. Do you know how many people have come to me over the years and said, Pastor, I could relate to you because you had drug and alcohol problems. I had drug and alcohol problems. I could relate to you because of this. 
You all have different people that you will become a pattern for their life because they can relate to your story. If you don't tell them your story, they don't have anything to relate to. They'll just label you as one of those right-wing conservative Christians. I've had people say, well, you know, you're a pastor and you've been in pastor world. and You know, I've, I've just had this terrible background. I've been demonized and, you know, I have drug problems and I have, I have anxiety. I've had anxiety disorders and I've been labeled a paranoid schizophrenic and you, you, you just can't relate to me. And I, so and I say, well, you know, I know this guy. Can I tell you his story? And I, I tell them my story. They don't know it's my story. And they go, that guy could really help me. How could I get a hold of him? I said, he's sitting right in front of you. And I said, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. The testimony of Jesus in my life is prophesying to you. And I've had people, no, you don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. They go, you don't realize I'm nuts. I said, I'm more nuts. <laughs> I told people in the first service, I, I'm extra nuts. I used to be just plain nuts. One of the men walked out, you're not extra nuts, Pastor, you're super nuts. So I'm super nuts in this service. You know, I'm, I'm crazy about Jesus because he can change people's lives. And they'll get you to argue about politics, argue about, you know, this, and argue about what the Congress is doing. And you know what? That's not the testimony of Jesus. And there's a place for those things. But people need to get saved. The only way our nation and the world is going to change is people getting saved. And yes, if you're in the marketplace, and yes, if you're in the school system, and yes, if you're a housewife, and yes, if you're on the PTA, and yes, if you're on the school board, have your influence and be a testimony about Jesus that you're so full of love, people will wonder if you're on drugs. Second punch, you're a pattern. I love 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but now you are sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Some of you were that way, but you were all washed, and Jesus will wash anybody that comes to him and receives him as their Lord and Savior. That's the message message the world needs to hear. And can I tell you, they're not telling them that on CNN and Fox News. That's our message that we need to preach to the world. And I'm not against news stations. I'm not against, I, well, I, well, I'm for Jesus. That's what I'm for. Anything that doesn't line up with Jesus better watch out. And so the second punch is you begin to use your, when, give, tell someone your testimony. Find someone that needs to hear what happened in your life. And when I first got saved, I told anybody that moved, breathed, walked. I told the developmentally disabled adults and children I worked with at Fircrest. I told the volunteers that came. I told all the people that I worked with. They, I, I would swing every conversation into the gospel I could. They talked about the Seahawks. I said, do you know that Jim Zorn and Steve Largent are born-again Christians? They look at me, they, I, it took me a while to figure out. I mean, remember, I, I'm this guy that carried around the Holy Bible that's this big and this thick that my wife gave me when she was Catholic and thought, I don't know what she thought when she gave it to me. I, I carried around, I, I mean, I carried around with me. I'd walk around like this with a big Holy Bible. People say, are you a Christian? I say, how do you know? <laughs> I took my wife on one of our first dates post me getting saved in our relationship. And I showed up at her door down and when she was going to the University of Washington, knocked on the door and I had my Bible. She says, what, what are you doing with that? I said, well, I thought... I could read it at the restaurant in between the courses. I was, I was a fanatic. You know what a fanatic is? Someone that loves Jesus more than you do. I was a fanatic. I was going to tell everybody whether they wanted to hear or not. And you know, I didn't know that much about the Holy Spirit. I just thought the reason they didn't get saved is they didn't know, so you just kept talking to them about it. I drove people nuts. I think some people got saved because they didn't want to go nuts from me telling them about Jesus. <laughs> But it was amazing when I gave testimony how many people got saved. When I didn't give testimony, nobody got saved. Hello? Yeah. Who are you going to give your testimony to? It might be someone at Starbucks. It might be in the line. It might be on the street. It might be one of the homeless people that you talk to. It might be the next Apostle Paul. Thirdly, the knockout punch is Paul's tongue glorified God. Paul's tongue he was full of thanksgiving. He had a full of his testimony, and he used his tongue to worship and praise God. 
In the middle of this, they say, why does Paul do this? You know what? After he talked about the grace of God and thought about his testimony, what should it cause you to do? It should cause you and I to what? Worship him. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is how I fight my battles. What did King Jehoshaphat do when it looked like he was going to get totally wiped out? Did they have a seminar and line up all the people and have a great debate? We're going to show that we're right and they're wrong. Guess what? He said, I am the chief of sinners. I'm the foremost example of sin to show that God in his long suffering made me a pattern, made me a sketch for other people to see. And you no longer have to be ashamed of your past if you've been forgiven. I wet the bed from the time I was six years old to 12 years old every night of my life. Brought incredible shame to my life before I got saved. Now I've told many young kids who battle with it, guess what, your pastor used to wet his bed every night for six years from grief of having lost my mother. Never dealt with it until I was 21 years of age when Christ came into my life. When people say, oh, you don't understand, I give them my testimony. Oh, you don't understand what it's like to have withdrawals. Oh, yes, I do. I was loaded once for 38 days straight. I had blackouts for up to three days, didn't know where I was. I used to come back into reality and with somebody's car I didn't know, and they told me I'd been with them for three days. I used to lose things. I used to have terrible blackouts, and I used to cry myself to sleep. I was demonized. But Jesus set me free. And there's a lot of people that need to hear your testimony. And they need to see why you're worshiping God because it wasn't because you just had a great life and you were such a wonderful person. You, were, you joined the chief of sinner gang. You got on the chain gang with the chief of sinners and started to walk with him and began to tell people what Jesus can do. He's the king eternal. That means he's the king of the eternal ages. I love what it says in Psalm 145. It's kind of hard to turn the pages with boxing gloves. <laughs> Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Every generation is going to hear the testimony of Jesus. The millennials are going to rise up. They're going to be one of the greatest generations in the world. And the generation Xers, Y, Z, B, Z, X, O, Z, Z, A, B, B, I, as soon as you figure it out, there's a new one. God's got all the generations ready to hear the testimony of Jesus. And we're worshipers of the one who rules in every generation. He's the invisible God. Don't be wasting with my message. He's the invisible God. Have you seen him who's invisible? I have. He gave me promises. He's fulfilling every single one of them. Every single one he's promised me he's fulfilling. It's the invisible God that does supernatural things. He's a supernatural God that loves to come into the midst of problems and trials and tests (laughs) under my feet. Right? Some of you need a little bit of an attitude. You're too nice. I don't like to fight, Pastor. You're in the wrong place. You're going to fight whether you want to or not. You might as well learn how to do it. You want to be a good fighter? Being a good fight. A good fight's one you win. Tell that person next to you. A good fight's one you win. A bad fight's one you lose. He alone is the wise God. He alone is the wise God. And we can worship him in, in the battle. If we begin to worship, it's, it's the knockout punch. When in the middle of your circumstances, like Abraham did on Mount Moriah, and he began to just worship, and he said, I and the ladder are going to go yonder and worship. Joseph had said, we don't know what to do in this battle, but our eyes upon you. Some of you have been winning, winning battles. Oh, man. Andrew, I sure love you. I sure love your mom and dad. We battled for you. They've really battled for you because they love you. Yeah. And God's got a purpose in your life. Yeah, right. And they stood every day. Every week they came here and they cried out to God. And God was faithful in the battle because he loves you, Andrew. You're back in the sound booth today. You're not in the streets anymore. I used to look for you, and your mom told me to pray for you, and I drove down my street. I'd say, God, touch Andrew. 
And I don't really want any credit because I know what your mom and dad did. They loved you and they prayed for you in the midst of the battle. They lifted their hands. It says in 2 Chronicles 20, when they began to praise the Lord, the Lord began to put ambushments among them. He began to rout the enemy. I don't care what your circumstances, I don't care how big your problem is. My God is bigger. And if you'll begin to worship the Lord and praise the Lord in the midst of the battle, you'll knock the devil out. You'll knock your circumstances into the place they need to be. In Revelation chapter 5, it says that all the living creatures and the four and twenty elders and all of heaven is gathered around the Lamb who was slain. And I'll close with this. I got a testimony this week from a young girl that grew up in this church. I've known her since she was little. She's now a Seattle Bible College student. It freaked me out that she's 46 years old. It made me feel older. (laughs) The only other time I felt older is when one of the students came and said, my mom and dad were your Bible school students. (laughs) I want you to listen to this because this is one of the issues. See, the issue of abortion is about saving the lives of those that God intended to have a destiny. And we're here to show love and mercy to anybody who's gone through the tragedy of an abortion. We're not here to point our fingers at people. We just say, come and join us, the gang of the chief of sinners, that Jesus came to send his son to die for and forgive and cleanse and remove the shame and remove the guilt. Pastor Dan Daly, I find myself in awe, wonder, and I'm humbled. God, my Father, chose me. I was chosen before my existence, the plan and purpose written upon my heart and the fabric of my being before I drew in my first breath. When I was in my 20s, my mom shared with me that she spent many hours in the abortion clinic while she was pregnant with me. My grandmother took her, my father, my mom's boyfriends, my mom drove herself every time she heard a voice say, not this one. My mom had had many abortions before and after this, after me, but she knew that in her heart, not this one. I always knew I had a purpose. I always knew in my heart God chose me, but for what? I always had a heart and mind to learn, reading every book I could get my hands on and on whatever subject I had interested in that time. And since August 10th, she had a meeting with Herb and myself in my office. She said, my ability to learn and understand has been on hyperdrive. I fall asleep asking God to reveal and wake up having dreams of some in full detail. As I read Nehemiah's words, as though we share the same heartbeat, she's studying the book of Nehemiah in one of our online classes. I feel his prayers deep within my spirit. My prayers have exp- expanded from myself, my family, and church family to my region and some days beyond. Every day seems to be a new revelation, a new learning curve, a new aspect of God's heart for his people. Pastor Herb, not at this meeting, but before her marks had a vision of me wearing a great black bear pelt on my head with thousands of people following me. At that time, we both thought that one day I would be a leader of my Native American people. The black pelt, pelt is representative of um, the greatest of, in their culture, and the greatest chiefs are given the, the bear pelt to wear. Today, as I read this vision from 1993, I realized that I had limited God. Today, I not, do not feel overwhelmed with all the irons in the fire. I feel overwhelmed that God would choose me, that my Father would use me to love so many, that my Heavenly Father would gift me with life, that his desire for me to live was so intense that every time my mom tried to abort me, he yelled within her being, not this one. That every time Satan tried to kill me with disease, God yelled, no, not this one. That I have the ability of, or the hand of God lifting me up in support for many strong men and women of God that encourage and gently push me toward, forward into the fullness of God. I find myself thinking often almost daily of that day laying in the hospital bed 30 years ago, listening to you on the phone, reading Psalms 91 over me. Some days it was as though I am back in that moment reliving the pain that I felt but I didn't feel. God in those moments allowed the pain and at the same time spared me from it. Those weeks in the hospital were almost an out-of-body experience. I saw myself crying out in pain and asking God to take me to heaven. Yet at the same time, asking him to allow me to live. I remember the sadness I felt as I watched those I love come into the room with the thought that the next time they would see me would be in heaven. Your words spoken to me with long life, you will satisfy him. Do you understand what that means, Becky? Do you know what that means? Ring in my ears daily. I know my purpose to satisfy my Jesus. The day, December 22nd, 2005, the doctor told me I had leukemia for the first time. I knew that I would be okay. I had the promise of a long life. Your words spoken to a sick, near-death 15-year-old girl who's now 46 ring daily. When I want to give up, when I experience pain, when life seems to swallow me whole, your voice says, Becky, with long life, 
Will I satisfy you? This morning I reread the paper I sent to you last night. Ironically, as, as I write papers during the week and re read before sending them much to my destiny, God often says, no, you will do this, and makes her rewrite it. Goes on to talk about her vision and all the ways she's affecting people. She said, thank you. You don't realize how one scripture verse spoken over someone's life, one prophetic word, one act of kindness. You know, as I read my Bible, yes, Jesus ministered to the, ministered to the multitudes, but most of his impact was on one-on-one -on -one encounters in small groups, speaking a word over somebody's destiny that had a need, calling life out of them. But you have incredible power in your testimony. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And we love not our lives unto death. And I need to close. But there's a picture there that was drawn. The picture there, I'm just going to explain it real quick, what you shared with me. And you can talk to her after. This is about the abortion issue. This is about the angels that are surrounding the United States of America. There's a huge issue going on. Remember Moses and the children were. Moses was, they tried to kill him because he would be the deliverer. I believe that the enemy is trying to kill the millennial generation and the generation to follow that's going to usher in the kingdom of God in a way we've never seen. We need to realize there's a battle. It talks about God's heart and the shape of the heart in the United States, and you can talk to Christy afterwards. And the what? The collage. The it's a collage of everything about this whole issue. There are babies that are going to be, going to be leaders. Would you just stand with me? We're going to close. You got your gloves on? You got your gloves on? You ready for a fight? I'm ready for a fight. The good fight of faith. To believe God. And your testimony is going to make a difference in people's lives. And Tracy, I want to pray for you before you leave. Way in the back, Tracy, all right? You hear me, Tracy? I want to pray for you before you leave. Thanksgiving, testimony, and using your tongue to worship. And you watch how the battle, it's so simple. The devil wants to get distracted and all these, you know, sometimes you read books and it sounds like you got to do like 47 things to get God's attention. Hello? Just begin to thank him and praise him. Just begin to worship him. You might be here today and you might not even know why you're here. I know why you're here if you don't know Jesus. Jesus wants to come into your life. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change your life. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works or we could boast. And he wants to release his grace over you. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants to come into your life and empower you for you to receive that super abundant, and you, you can become super nuts like me if you want. I used to just be plain nuts, and then I got saved. Now I'm super nuts for Jesus. It's a lot better than being a paranoid schizophrenic, let me tell you. I don't know what your background is, but Jesus will change you. And Paul's life was a pattern for you. He came to save sinners. All you have to do is admit you're a sinner. That can be a humbling experience. I had to say after 21 years, I've been wrong for 21 years. I've been in control of my life and messed it up. I thought I had the world by the tail, and now the world's got me by a tail. But I surrender to Jesus. And if you'll ask him to forgive you, if you believe he died and rose from the dead for you, he'll come into your life and he'll change you. I don't care how bad your past has been. In modern vernacular, God's way better. And I mean that in the best possible sense. He's good. God's a good God. And he saves and he touches. Let's bow your heads for a moment. Is there anyone say, that's me, Pastor Dan? I need to surrender to Jesus. I need to give my life. I want you to just lift your hand up high and wave it. Well, heads are bowed and Eyes are closed. Just wave your hand if that's you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? It's worth the whole, the whole day. All heaven. As big as a soul and as small as it is. One soul, there's another. Thank you. God bless you. You can put your hand down yeah. on this side, that young lady. And this good news? Yeah. This is way better than arguing and chanting slogans at someone. Getting people saved one at a time like we did with our testimony. Anyone else would like to join these two? Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender. I want to be forgiven. Just pray this prayer out loud with me. And the two that raise their hand, pray this prayer. We have a, a really neat, spirit-filled, expensive Bible we want to give you. 
We used to give chintzy Bibles. We don't give chintzy Bibles anymore. You can actually read the print on this one. You don't need a magnifying glass. It's a nice spirit-filled Bible. They're, they're, they cost a lot of money. We want you to have the best because you just become a child of God when you were surrendered today. So pray this prayer. Dear Father, I thank you for Jesus. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I turn from my sin. I admit I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart and life and touch me and change me. Save me. I am now your child. I give my life to you. Take my life and use it for your glory and honor. And I confess that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. He shed his blood for me. He rose from the dead for me. And now I receive him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ask those two that raised their hand to be the first two to walk up. It's like you to walk up. We want to give you a Bible and pray for you if you come. God bless you. Come on. Woo. Awesome. Woo.